Welcome to this Blue Deal debate, our 14th opportunity to discuss our seas, our fishing industry and the marine environment. I'm Chris Davis. I'm a former chair of the European Parliament's Fisheries Committee and a senior advisor to Brud, <laughs> to Rudd Pedersen Public Affairs in Brussels. And today, thanks to the sponsorship of the Marine Stewardship Council, we're discussing the management of fishing in the high seas those waters that don't fall within any national jurisdiction and include two thirds of our oceans and half the surface area of our planet. It's such a large area that at one time, people would have thought that fish life within it was inexhaustible. Well, we know different now. The UN's Food and Agriculture Organization tells us that only 64% of stocks globally are being fished at a sustainable level. But it's not all bad news. There are encouraging signs that the need for effective governance of our seas and our fishing is not only increasingly recognised, but is also being more often practised. And we're going to discuss how our seas are managed and what's needed to make them better managed. I'm joined to help us do that with Rowan Curry, Chief Science and Standards Officer of the Marine Stewardship Council, and Erin Priddle, the MSC's North Europe Regional Director by Victor Restrepo, Chair of the Scientific Committee of the International Seafood Sustainability Foundation, and Dave Robb, Program Lead for Sea Further Sustainability with Cargill Aqua Nutrition. Now, those of you who've watched Blue Deal debates in the past may be surprised not to see someone from the European Commission on our panel, as they've so often taken part in the past. But it seems that a decision has been taken not to participate which may have something to do with the very delicate negotiations now taking place between the coastal states of the Northeast Atlantic and the concern to ensure that no one says anything that might be misinterpreted in any way at all. So good luck to all those negotiators who recognize the need for stocks to be fished sustainably, but we're free to say whatever we like. And we've lots to talk about. And for those of you watching, please feel free to send in questions and we'll try to address some of these in the last half hour of our webinar. So let me start by asking you, Rowan, can you explain just what arrangements are in place somehow to manage fishing in the high seas, the high seas, the huge areas of ocean which are under no national control? Because, well, more than a third of the world's fishing is not being managed sustainably. So whatever we've got in place doesn't seem to be working very effectively. But what have we got in place? Over to you. Thank you very much, Chris, and wonderful to be part of this. RFMOs, Regional Fisheries Management Organisations, are the primary body that is responsible for managing the way fisheries operate on the high seas. They were created as a, as a product of the United Nations Law, on, Law of the Sea which established that an expectation that governments would collectively work to manage the high seas. They've been set up primarily to focus on managing the target species that many member governments wish to fish for in the high seas, but with an obligation to conserve marine living resources. So this is the expectation that comes from that original law of the sea treaty and with an expectation of sustainable management as part of the mandate for these bodies. Okay, but they're government organisations, are they? I mean, who, who, who has a vote? Who has a say in deciding policy? Yeah, it's a great question, Chris. So the, the, the composition of, a, of regional fisheries management organisations varies depending on what they are responsible for. But they're basically a product of a, a number of member governments collectively deciding that they will come together to manage stocks. So it's not formally required that every government is a member of an RFMO, but usually those with an interest in fishing in a particular area will come together. And when they are then part of that, that body, they then have a say in how that body works, what it governs and how it governs it. They preside over passing what are often referred to as conservation and management measures. Those are kind of the, the laws that are effectively in, put in place by those bodies, but they only become real when those member governments take those, those measures back to their own countries and enshrine it in their own legislation. So although they are these bodies to, designed to manage this area, it is through the member governments actually taking action that management actually is effective. 
one last question before I took, I will come back to you, don't worry about it. But um, one last question, do they cover all the seas, you know, 50% of the, of, the, of, the, of the surface area of the planet? So they, is everything now covered by some sort of organization? RFMOs cover most of the uh, of the world's oceans, but not all of the oceans and not for all species in all circumstances. They are usually, they are specific to a set of species that they identify, a set of, an, and a defined geographic area in the oceans. And this has led to a patchwork of RFMOs operating in different locations with slightly different mandates, and in some cases, quite different rules, even for similar fisheries in different parts of the world. So it is quite a patchwork of different arrangements with some gaps. And so people could legitimately target species outside of an RFMO in some parts of the world, and they're effectively outside the bounds of regulation. Okay, Victor, turning to you, Rowan mentioned that uh, RFMOs have been enshrined by, by the law of the sea, which I think came in in the 1980s. But I think the, fir the first RFMO I read was actually created back 1949 or so after the Second World War. Um, I mean, there's, there's, am I right? There's 17 of these organizations globally. You've been involved for many decades, I think. I've been involved primarily with the tuna ones, and there are five such RFMOs. And the one that you mentioned is the IATTC, which manages tunas in the Eastern Pacific Ocean. And that was created in 1949. And it wasn't really created to manage tuna fisheries. It was created to reach agreements over anchovetas, which were used as bait for the tuna fisheries. And that organization has evolved over the decades, and now it's very focused on, on tuna management. Okay. And you've been yourself involved? Just just, just explain that to, to, to us. How long have you been involved with, uh, with an RFMO? Uh, I was involved with ICAT, which is the Atlantic one that manages tunas starting in about 1991 as a member of the U.S. scientific delegation. And I eventually worked for the ICAT secretariat as assistant executive secretary for like 10 years or something like that. So okay. I've been involved since the early 1990s. So you've been involved in stitching together deals? Mm, more witnessing it <laughs> and, uh, and providing advice, yes. Okay. Okay, but I, I've got to say, you know, just as someone who I've been to one ICAT meeting over the, over the years, but, you know, I don't follow these things in detail. But my impression is, as I look at the FAO figures, you know, the, 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 the problem of uh, still a third of our seas being fished unsustainably, that you know, the RFMOs can't be very effective. And, and what you have is a lot of, lot of governments coming in, listening to their, perhaps just listening to their fishing interests and putting short term matters as a priority and you know squabbling and just not, not being effective is that fair uh i think that the connection you're making between the 33 percent and the high seas is not uh fully correct because that 33 percent is of stocks globally and many 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 of those stocks are just in in national jurisdictions or in coastal waters not in the high seas necessarily so I don't think the situation for the high seas is, in general, at least for the tunas, which is what I'm most concerned with, uh, it's not so dire. Uh, in fact, we believe that 85%, well, we know 85% of the tuna catch globally comes from healthy stocks. So that figure is quite different. Okay, uh, you're saying 85% you're saying. of tuna is now coming from sustainable stocks. Yes. That's, it's an encouraging thing. Rowan, just let me come back on to you. Is that chief scientific advisor and the like for the for, for MSC? Is that is that I mean just to, is that figure confirmed? It, yes, Connected? absolutely. And it reflects the fact that for, for tuna fisheries, in part their their stock status has been has been quite healthy for quite some time for some of the larger stocks. So for example, skipjack in, in many of the large ocean basins has been is 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 in quite good shape. And I think as a result of that, you see that reflected in those figures. Um, and also tuna stocks generally are reasonably productive. And so for want of a better term, they're quite forgiving of the fact that there hasn't always been rigorous management in place in all circumstances to, to those those situations. 
Where we've tended to find the problems in the high seas it has been traditionally when exploitation has been very high, which has happened in some locations, and that's often just the race to fish, um, or if it's been targeting species that are particularly vulnerable. So, for example, some of the species that are often by caught in some of the large fisheries that operate, such as some shark species in particular, are quite susceptible to over-exploitation, and they have they have have not necessarily responded particularly well. So I think it, it, it varies depending on the species you're talking about. But Victor's absolutely right. Tuna stocks overall are in quite good shape. There are some exceptions, and those exceptions generally would benefit from better management. But I think you would say that there are some really good examples of RFMO best practice when it comes to tuna in the Pacific, for example. Yeah, we've been quite fortunate to see a, a recent uptick in the in the management performance of, of a number of the RFMOs that are associated with tuna fisheries. And in part, this has been associated with the MSC's expectation that fisheries that wish to be certified must have in place what we refer to as, as harvest strategies. So they re must require that they basically have a management system that responds to changes in stock performance. So when a stock declines, the fishery should introduce the right measures and then follow those measures to deliver an improved outcome for the stock and enable it to recover. And we have seen a number of fisheries management authorities associated with tuna, so the bigger RFMOs that are focused on tuna, start to look at this quite seriously. And most notably over the, the latter part of last year, we saw uh, the adoption of a couple of, of really important measures, one of which focused on Atlantic bluefin tuna um, in ICAT, and we most recently saw it as well for skipjack tuna in the RFMO that, that represents the about 50% of the global tuna catch, the Western and Central Pacific Fisheries Commission, they, they adopted a harvest strategy for what is effectively the largest tuna fishery on the planet, the skipjack tuna fishery in that region. Um, and that's very promising. And in part, it was to address this expectation that if tuna fisheries wish to be certified, they must actually have these harvest strategies in place. So that was really, really encouraging from our perspective, proving that management measures can be adopted by these bodies and they can then take action. OK, so that's, a, I mean, from both Victor and, and Rowan, we get some examples here of, of, of positivity and good practice and, and, and such like. Erin, let me turn to you, though, because you're, in, you're, you know, you're dealing with the Northeast Atlantic. And as we know, um, the agreement such as it is about about stocks and harvest control and, and and such like seems to have just fallen apart in the northeast atlantic is this an is this an example of bad practice i suppose <laughs> Um, yeah, that's relatively accurate, I would say. Um, what we're seeing in the Northeast Atlantic, um, which is the NEAF RFMO, the North, Northeast Atlantic Fisheries Commission, um, so they're responsible for um, those shared stocks uh, under the enclosed, which uh, Rowan referred to earlier in the webinar. Um, so the key stocks that are of interest here are, include blue whiting, uh, mackerel, and also Atlanta Scandian herring. So these are sort of managed um, via the coastal states that are all parties to the NEAF RFMO. Uh, but what's really happened is the last, over the last 10 years, uh, even more, we've not had these agreements in place and the harvest control rules and the harvest strategies that Rowan referred to, these are, these are kind of fundamental principles of how you manage uh, straddling stocks. So the nation states uh, that are interested in harvesting them can respond effectively when there is a change in the stock. And so what we've seen in the, in the pelagics, in the case of the pelagics, is that in the last 25 years, only four of those years have had these agreements in place. And what we see is that without agreements in place, you have um, overexploitation of the stock, you can have overfishing, and in a worst case scenario, you can have stock collapse. And we've actually seen this with the Lantoscanian herring stock back in the 60s, when the stock did indeed collapse and has been uh, trying to rebuild um, over, the, over the past decades. Uh, so we don't want to see that again, Chris. Okay. Um, and in practical terms, what this means to me is that when I go and buy my mackerel, my smoked mackerel, in the supermarket, it no longer has an MSC blue tick on it to say it's sustainable. 
Unfortunately, that's the case. Uh, Macro lost its certification back in 2019, and Alento Scandian Herring and also Blue Whiting lost their certification in 2020. Um, so while the market takes a while to respond because there are, of course, uh, stockpiles of these fisheries and they're very big uh, in the ambient, uh, you know, the can sector, uh, it takes a little while for uh, the repercussions of suspension to take hold. But currently in the UK market, um, you'd be hard pressed to find a mackerel product now with the MSC uh, tick on it. But but what's happening in the in the Northeast Atlantic suggests that you know well I mean each RFMO may be different, but there's sort of there's, there's no rules. I mean people there's there's been a gentleman's agreement if you like in the past about the sharing of of stocks and I don't know it, it, that seems to have fallen apart and I don't know how you put it back together again other than presumably people try and do make arrangements behind the scenes about other things which may be completely unconnected with fish but just deal with the relationship between governments and, and, and nations. This is it. Uh, NEAFG is effectively the secretariat for these coastal states so you have um, the, the UK now outside of the EU so you have the UK as an independent coastal state, the EU, Norway, Faroes, Greenland, Iceland and Russia. Some of these nations are a coastal state for mackerel and some are a fishing state. The coastal state means that these countries have mackerel within the 200 EEZ, their exclusive economic zone. Um, but the Russian Federation accesses mackerel on the high seas. So there's a real need to use NIAFG as this platform for negotiation and for discussion to be able to agree what that uh, quota share should look like. What's happened uh, in the NIAF uh, RFMO is that the coastal states um, on a national level set attack in line with what they feel should be the pressure on the stock. Um, but when this is combined, you have attack that is fairly far outside the scientific limit. And the scientific limit or the scientific advice is set by ICES, the International Council for Exploration of the Seas. And what we've seen in the case of the pelagic in recent years is that there's over exploitation for mackerel, for example, of up to 40%. So when you take all of those national tax and you add them up, you have over exploitation of about 140% of the stock. And so while the, the biomass of these stocks is relatively okay, stocks cannot withstand the sustained pressure of ex over exploitation. Uh, without having some level of risk applied to them. So without the management in place, the risk of stock overexploitation and potentially overfishing uh, is taking place. But everyone talks the language of sustainability, don't they? I mean, I remember meeting a, a delegation, I was chair of the Fisheries Committee. I remember uh, meeting a delegation from Iceland, from the Icelandic government, uh, <laughs> who were saying, yes, you know, we want we want a fair deal, but, but you know, we're determined to have sustainable fisheries and ensure that mackerel stocks are here for the long term? I mean, everyone talks sustainability, despite the fact that you're just saying they're not practicing sustainability. Exactly. And I think this is where uh, the MSC were really interested to host this debate and where our standard actually emphasizes and prioritizes um, the need for strong, robust management under our principle three. And this I think from perhaps a national perspective, everyone thinks that they're they're fishing sustainably, that they are uh, their fisheries are in line with the tax that are set by the national governments. But through um, through the MSC's lens, through our principles one, two, and three, that third one around governance and management is so important, and this is what is absent in these fisheries at this current time. Without a long-term management agreement that actually helps set what that quota allocation is going to be amongst the participating nations, you'll have continued risk and overexploitation of these stocks. Okay, thank you. Just, just, just exploring that word sustainability. Um, is this the language now of our FMOs? I mean, do governments do governments recognise that the, that that uh, if you if you just set targets of uh, for fish catching, for harvest control, or whatever, which is only only looking to the short term, then in the long term, you're damaging your industry, you're damaging the future of, of, of the fishing industry, you're damaging potentially the ability of your, of your of your country to feed its people. Victor, in the RFMOs, have you have you seen a change in the language? Is it is there, is there a genuine understanding now about this? 
Yes, I think so. I think there is a clear recognition that uh, they should follow the scientific advice and the scientific advice is designed to meet certain objectives of the conventions of, of the commissions uh, in this case. And those objectives are things like mm, biomass levels above the maximum sustainable yield level and things like this. So there is that recognition. However, sometimes negotiations fail because underneath that, there is a need to decide how to allocate the catches between the different RFMO members. Wow. And that's where the negotiations break down very often. And that's the case uh, of NIAC, uh, perhaps. And that's the case in all of the RFMOs. And yeah, uh, yeah. as an example, Bluefin tuna in the Eastern Atlantic and Mediterranean was uh, a disaster for many years. And, you know, it nearly collapsed and everyone uh, criticized ICAT for the lack of action. Uh, but once they agreed on an allocation key for all the members, then they were able to to put in good management in place. And now it's a really well-managed fishery. And it's one of the ones Rohan mentioned earlier, adopted a harvest strategy last year. Yes, the case of bluefin tuna in the Mediterranean is one of those, well, is, is, one of the, is it a good example of a success story, I think, in, in turning around a situation that did look as though we were just going to completely wipe out that uh, that species in in that sea but, um, it, but it took like 12 years to turn it around it and a lot of money and a lot of resources were put into it not least to control the criminal activity because the the you know the, the bluefin tuna was simply so valuable um yeah indeed but it has been a success story which is you know good for everyone who's interested in the environment and, and sometimes gets depressed about the about uh, the backward steps we so often seem to be taking dave from Cargill, can I can I can I bring you in because I'm I'm interested to, to know to what extent is Cargill as one of the biggest buyers of fish products in, in the world genuinely interested in this this principle of sustainability and to what extent are your customers interested in sustainability even if they're not using that word? Thanks, Chris. I, I think um, our customers are increasingly using the uh, having a focus on sustainability, sustainability of aquaculture feeds that they're purchasing to, to feed their fish and shrimp around the world. And it, it feeds into a global uh, requirement from uh, consumers on, on sustainably sourced seafood and also fitting into the certification schemes that we see uh, to, to verify that sustainability in place. And I think we, we need to also consider the definitions around sustainability as we take some of these discussions forward, the, the definitions that nations may have on sustainability versus the, the verification of sustainability that we see through certification programs. But that then cascades back up through us. Um, my part of Cargill that I work for is, is making aquaculture feeds uh, around the world. Uh, and we purchase a, a portion of our, uh, of our raw materials come from marine ingredients, fish meal and fish oil from from multiple different fisheries around the world. And since 2004, we have taken a, a strong interest in where we are sourcing from, the fisheries that we're sourcing from, and, and, and broadly how well they're managed uh, using an originally the Sustainable Fisheries Partnership tools, which were available to us at, at that point, fish source, to see how well the stocks are managed. And moving forwards as they develop, the certification schemes, um, Marin Trust and, and uh, MSC, looking at at the states of the fisheries um, and, and how responsibly or sustainably preferably they are managed and being able to make choices between where we source from based on that and where there are um, failings or, or, or we're not meeting the certification schemes can we work with the the fishers and the and the nations and, and rfmos involved to improve things through fishery improvement projects not just walking away from the problem but actually dealing with the problem can we can we work with the nations to to get these harvest strategies in place and, and sometimes that's successful and sometimes in the, in the NIAF case um, where we, we need to put pressure on on the on the stakeholders and the fisheries uh, we we have done that in terms of stepping out of, of purchasing blue whiting for a year whilst um, whilst the nations were coming together to agree to to put a, a fishery improvement program in place you would argue, I think, that Cargill now accepts the, the importance of, of sustainability, of, lo of, uh, of looking to the long term in order to ensure that supplies are available for, for decades, for centuries, for centuries to come. 
but that's not always been the case you know i mean the, the big the big fish buyers the big fish producers frankly have been part of the problem for for, for 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 much of the the 20th century and probably many still are in the 21st century you you would argue that cargill really has made a transition in attitude if nothing else Yes, I think we, we well, I know we have, uh, and and I and I see how we're we're sourcing our materials, and that has changed over time, and and it's changed partly because the market has changed as well. We're able to, we have tools that allow us to assess the status of of those fisheries. We're we're not experts on on fishery management. We need to have tools and resources available to us to enable us to make those choices. We are also in a in a nice position in that to a, to a degree fish meal is fish meal and fish oil is fish oil and we can source from multiple different fisheries and species according to how sustainably those are uh, those are available but if you want to sell atlantic mackerel you only have one choice uh, and for an iconic fish like atlantic mackerel or uh, atlanta scandinavian herring which are staple parts of a european diet that puts a lot of challenge on the sourcing materials in order to be able to deliver those fish. So we were able to step out of fisheries, which we judged not to be performing in line with our credentials, and then engage in improvement programs to, to start moving in the right direction. Well, you, you talked a lot about you talked a lot about certification. Yes. And I just wondered what, you know, presumably certification to demonstrate that your fish meal, your fish oil was coming from a from sustainably sourced fish. Now, is that pressure coming from, I don't know, where, where, where's the pressure for that coming from? Are you, you wouldn't be doing that if, if you weren't under some sort of pressure to ensure that you were only, only buying certified fish? I think that that's fair, Chris. I think we, we have had an internal drive to do that, but obviously certification has implications on, on sourcing and, and cost. And therefore, we have to have an acceptance from our customers, um, fish farmers, and their customers, ultimately the consumer, to be able to, to cover those costs. So there is an expectation coming up the supply chain uh, that um, fisheries are, being, uh, are, are managed sustainably, but also internally with our, within our own uh, colleagues. We, we also want to be developing sustainable fisheries. We don't want to be part of an over-exploitation um, of, of, of fisheries and, and that's where we engage in the fishery improvement programs to, to bring those up. Okay, okay. Um, just let me uh, hold for a second and just say to people who've joined that uh, on the panel here today, talking about the governance of the high seas of the world, we have uh, Rowan Curry, who's the Chief Science and Standards Officer for the Marine Stewardship Council and his colleague, Erin Priddle, the uh, Regional Director for North Europe for the MSC. Uh, we have Victor Restrepo, Chair of the Scientific Advisory Committee of the International Seafood Sustainability Foundation. And you've just heard Dave Robb, Program Lead, Sea Further Sustainability with Cargill Aqua Nutrition. And you've all been terribly positive, actually. I mean, with the exception of Erin, of course, who's uh, <laughs> describing the Northeast Atlantic, which is, you know, if we've got examples of, of, of good practice that Rowan's illustrated in the Pacific, we've also got examples of, of bad practice when the arrangements start to start to fall apart. Um, we'll address you know, how we can promote the good practice shortly. But um, Rowan, um, just explain to me, um, in the news of late, of course, has been the High Seas Treaty. We're talking about the governance of the high seas and the, and the fisheries. So where's the overlap between what we've been saying about the governance of fishing activities by RFMOs and the, the High Seas Treaty that uh, we hope will be formally adopted in months, years to come? Yeah, thank you, Chris. This is this is a really interesting one. And I would say we're still at the stage of of working out precisely what it will actually mean in practice. But we saw this this remarkable adoption of this this treaty, which is going to to regulate the high seas under a, a UN a new UN treaty that effectively um, is is designed to cover a multitude of activities, I would say, in a way that is more cross cutting than what current management arrangements have been in the high seas. And this has often been one of the, the criticisms from, from various various um, concerned parties about the way that the high seas have been managed. This has been very piecewise and very much focused on the activities of individual actors rather than treating the, 
that marine environment holistically. So I think the aspiration for this treaty is that it provides the framework that will then enable management of this, including through things like marine protected areas, to cover multiple human activities and how they would interact. There's still an expectation from, from my cursory examination of the treaty language that suggests that there is going to be an interaction between this treaty and the way that regional fisheries management organisations continue to work. Um, and exactly how that works in practice, I think, is something that will probably take quite some time to work through. And of course, like any treaty, it it's only comes into force when it's ratified. And, and there's quite a quite a step to go through there as the member governments will have to go back, take it back to their capitals and, and look at this and then work out whether they're going to enshrine it in legislation. Um, as that process unfolds, I think one of the things that I would be encouraging governments to think about is how they see this actually working in practice and how they can engage with the stakeholders who are going to be affected by it to make it effective. Because I would be very concerned about seeing a, 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 this instrument that was created with the intent of trying to be holistic just turn into something that, in, that imposes changes without consideration of those who are affected. But equally, I would hate to see it turn into what often get referred to as paper parks, where people have these these marine protected areas that are defined, but they don't actually have concrete objectives and a way of delivering an outcome. So I think it's it's incumbent on the governments to actually work out now what that, this will mean in practice and to to take that on board as they try to try to move that forward. Because I expect we will see proposals for marine protected areas arise from this and a number of other initiatives emerge in the coming months and years. So it'll be fascinating to see as that unfolds. Okay, so th there's a lot of uncertainties there. Uh, Victor, coming to you, um, again, you may want to comment upon the uh, the overlap between the High Seas Treaty and RFMOs, but I'm also interested in, in who influences the RFMOs, because, uh, you know, I've heard criticisms from many NGOs that the fish, fishing industry has an, un, you know, has, has behind the scenes, behind the scenes access to policymakers um, and uh, you know, basically, they 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 uh, they're putting their short their short term commercial interests before the long term needs of the of the globe. Yeah, I think the at least in the two hour for most the fishing industry has always been there, not so much behind the scenes, but really you know in front of everyone. It's been obvious that they they have been influencing the decision makers uh, of their flag states, and this has happened for years. But I have seen during my time involved in the two hour FMOs a tremendous change in terms of who influences those decision makers. And now there's a whole spread of stakeholders that are very, very diverse. Uh, there are many more NGOs now than there used to be. Uh, for example, including the Marine Stewardship Council is now involved uh, as an observer in all of the RFMOs. My organization many others, not just uh, the traditional two or three uh, NGOs that used to attend the RFMOs. The industry, fishing industry, continues to be there, but now you have other parts of the industry and other parts of the supply chain also being involved. You have organizations that represent mostly retailers that go to the RFMOs, and they want, the retailers want something for the long term. They don't want immediate, you know, uh, uh, huge amounts of catches to be sold. They want like a steady uh, programmed sourcing. You have processors on other part of the industry also present now, uh, and they want the same as retailers. They want to be there for hundreds of years. They don't want to make, you know, a whole bunch of millions of dollars now and then leave. Uh, so there is a combination of stakeholders that are all influencing the decision makers. And Finally, I would say that the science bodies of the RFMOs have a tremendous in influence uh, because they are the ones that provide scientific advice according to the objectives of the commission. So they are kind of a, a guiding light uh, that has to be followed and everyone criticizes the decision makers if they're not following the scientific advice. So I think they also have a lot of influence. Yeah, if they know, um, and I, I asked that question because the uh, the matter of transparency in some RFMOs or the lack of transparency sometimes comes to the surface. 
I mean, presumably there are, there are examples of good practice here, but there will be examples of, of bad practice, Victor. Yes, yes. Uh, for example, in the five tuna RFMOs, they all have a compliance process in place to look at compliance with, with the decisions that have been uh, made on TACs or, or whatever management measure. Uh, but all five of them are really different in how those compliance mechanisms work. And for example, in one of them, observers are not allowed in the room when they're talking about compliance, while in others, everyone is allowed in the room when they're uh, talking about compliance. So this is very, very important. Uh, I personally believe that the more transparency, the better the better functioning of, of an RFMO. Thank you. Erin, uh, just uh, you've said to me before when we've discussed that uh, the Marine Stewardship Council doesn't campaign, but it does practice soft advocacy. And I suppose, and, and the most effective way I suppose you do that is, is, by, is by working with those fishing interests that have adopted MSE certification and therefore have, a, have an interest in, in, in promoting good practice and, and uh, recognition of that certification. Uh, Hamin, how do you how do you find the process of actually persuading fishing companies, fishing f fishers, to adopt MSC certification? Is that a is that easier now than it used to be, or, or what's the situation? <laughs> Probably not. I mean, we're in a um, a world that's evolving under a lot of political change, um, the impacts of climate stocks distributing uh, faster than than they have ever been been before. So I think it's actually a very challenging uh, political climate. And I think it's also very challenging uh, for the industry as well, for the fishing industry. <clears throat> I mean, the MSE were an incentive-based program, so completely voluntary. Uh, we try and ensure that uh, we have an incentive-based program that encourages fisheries uh, to want to be part of it. Um, to demonstrate their sustainability through third-party assurance and accreditation through both our fishery standard and our chain of custody standard. Um, and, and that's the attractive element, I think, for fisheries. Um, there's a sort of consistency to market, access to market, but importantly, demonstrating their sustainability credentials to the outside world. And that's been a really important feature of our program. I think with these particular fisheries, um, well, the principle one and two around stock health and uh, ecosystem impacts has been uh, relatively um, with high integrity. It is that principle three around governance and management um, that has really fallen on its sword in the case of the pelagics and something that needs to be strengthened. I think when we talk about RFMOs, um, it's important to look at the role of coastal states in that. So we talked about the different actors, the supply chain, the NGOs. I mean, the coastal states, some uh, I can argue could get a deal tomorrow if they wanted to. But what, what is actually impeding an agreement? Where's the impasse and where's the blockage? And I think that responsibility of the coastal states and in EF, that's how it kind of, it, it works really. It's the coastal states having these bilateral or multilateral agreements in place and using NEAFG as that platform for discussion and for negotiation. And I think as such, because you do have this kind of bilateral exchange, that transparency level hasn't been as high as it has been in other RFMOs that Victor had talked about, because really observers are, are welcome to the NEAFG annual meeting. But in terms of those bilaterals that are taking place across the year, you don't have observers in there. And only until recently are they actually inviting observers in in the plenary um, after the negotiation concludes. So it is improving, but we'd like to see more of that. So civil society groups and other actors who have an interest in the sustainability of these fisheries have more oversight into what's happening uh, throughout the year and can help, uh, can try and influence that through hard advocacy or in the case of MSC through soft advocacy where we like uh, to talk uh, bilaterally with our fishing representatives, with governments and, and others in terms of the call to action here, which it really is ensuring that uh, the coastal states are setting their attacks in line with science when all of those attacks are combined. Okay, but you have you have obviously fishing companies, fishing uh, fishers who have an interest in supporting, who share your objectives. I mean, for example, uh, I was reading from the comments of Mike Park of the uh, Scottish whitefish 
uh, associations, Scottish Whitefish Fish Producers Association, I think, or Fishing Association, um, you know, got MSC certification, wants agreements, perhaps they want agreement on their own terms, but uh, there, there are presumably some powerful commercial interests in the fishing industry that want agreement between governments, between the coastal states here. Absolutely, absolutely. And often I think the fishing industry is, is you know, following those uh, coastal states, the government negotiators where, where they are negotiating. I think it's very um, a kind of a tight relationship there. But um, I think ultimately, yeah, fisheries would love to see a positive outcome for this, but um, they are part of this as well. And they're a, quite an influential lobby with their coastal state representatives as well. So there's... <laughs> Sure, but this but this can't always be the case. Um, uh, who should I go to? Rowan first, and then Victor. I mean, because because in many cases globally, globally you've still got um, countries and you've still got fishing companies that rec that that that, uh, that are trying to take shortcuts. I mean, we've got still a huge amount of IUU illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing taking place. And when we go to these negotiations, there must be a lot of fishing companies that are thinking, look, the more controls placed on us, the lower our profits are going to be. Um, in the in the short term, in the short term, and we're only interested in the short term. I mean, I mean, frankly, this is all a bit too positive. I I I, I think. <laughs> Let me come to you, Rowan. I mean, yeah, apart, you, from, apart from anything else, besides besides the fact there's lots of people there who are, who perhaps don't want long term agreements. Once you have an agreement in place about the management of stocks, who actually enforces the rules? I mean, we haven't got an international international fishing control agency going out there and and stopping bad practices who actually does it they, they, they're two great points chris i think the the first it, it comes back to the fact that there is a real trade-off that individuals need to weigh up between what their short-term self-interest is and what's in the long-term benefit of all involved in the fishing activity one of the things that we probably don't make enough of is the fact that managing your fish stocks generally gives you more catch in the long run right mm -hmm. and i think we we don't highlight that enough because i think there is an expectation that because there's a often there's catch cuts to put in place measures that will put you in a place where you then ensure something in the long term there is this sense of it's a sacrifice for sustainable outcomes actually you get a bonus because you're by definition trying to fish to a target that at least based on the scientific advice should give you the maximum sustainable yield, right? So I think, and that's something that's probably underappreciated. And again, we don't make enough of is that that by its definition should give a better eat outcome in terms of output from the system. So I think there is this sense of the short-term self-interest, but it really needs to be weighed up against that long-term gain. And just to touch briefly on your point about who's actually enforcing this. Well, the RFMOs are a little unusual in that they basically have, because the, the powers effectively come from the member governments who regulate the activity of the vessels who, who send them to fish in these areas, a lot of it still comes back to those member governments to, to deal with this. So there's still an expectation. If you send your vessels as a, as a nation, if you have flagged vessels fishing in an area, you have an obligation to, to make sure that those vessels are, are following the laws that you should have put in your legislation. So just because it's on the high seas doesn't mean it's completely lawless. It shouldn't be. And I think if people are acting in that manner, that, that means those flag states who have flagged them are, are letting things slide that shouldn't happen. And yeah. this is to Victor's point, this is why compliance needs to be transparent, because that's the only way you hold those individual actors to account if they allow these things to slide. Because mm -hmm. ultimately, everyone needs to be holding everyone else to collectively quite a high standard for a system to be successful. And the more transparency there is, the easier it is to do that. And I think it's, the difficulty comes when these things are shrouded in mystery and, 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 and cloaked in a way that is not not transparent to the parties who have an interest in it. Yeah, and the EU I know has often uh, put put this issue on the on the on the on the table when it comes to negotiating trade agreements with countries that it wants to see enforcement of uh, of, of rules and sometimes trade agreements, for example, with Vietnam have been delayed because of uh, uh, because of concern that uh, good practice was not being followed and enforcement was not being carried out. Um, Victor, can I come on to you and same sort of question, really? I mean, you know, as you look at uh, uh, RFMOs globally, um, there must be still pe some people there arguing 
arguing special pleading, I suppose, um, and insisting on, on on being able to fish to the maximum extent possible. And I mean, I just don't know how how do you how do you actually get the enforcement in place? How do you do you, how do you get the government commitment to to ensure that once they've signed up to to something or what their representative has signed up to something, it actually gets followed through by their administration? It it's crucial, and I've given a couple of examples that you said, Chris, are maybe too positive. And I won't say that in the two narrow FMOs, everything is peachy and rosy. Uh, there is a lot of difficult things that need to be tackled. Uh, enforcement is one of them. Like Rohan said, the only way you can tell apart the countries that are serious about enforcing rules and the countries that are not is through these collective compliance mechanisms that have to be transparent. That That's really why that is so important in, in the RFMOs. Uh, but also enforcement in the high seas is very difficult, especially for less developed countries uh, that don't have the resources. Uh, that's, that's a tricky thing. And they are a very important part of the RFMOs. Uh, I think ICAT has something like 54 members, and most of them are developing coastal states. And they don't have the same resources as, for example, the EU would have or, or the USA uh, to, to carry out this enforcement. So that needs to be taken into consideration. And it, it also gives a responsibility to the developed countries to help them uh, develop the capacity to enforce and, and to better manage their fisheries. So there's a lot of challenges. And I would summarize it as, you know, fisheries management is really, really hard. And it it has it has many, uh, you know, it's it's a multi faceted job. It has many, many components. And it's not as simple as some people would like to see. Oh, all you need is a large MPO, APA, and you, you need to forget about everything else. That's never the case. There is no simplistic silver bullet solution to any of these problems. Build, thank you very much, Victor. B building, Dave, uh, Dave Rob of, of Cargill, just uh, building on this issue of, uh, of the degree to which commercial interests can influence policy for the better. Cargill being one of the largest buyers, fish producers. I mean, you're involved in CBOS, which I think is uh, it, it's an alliance of the, the top 10 fish producers, which is campaigning well tell us what it's campaigning for it's campaigning for for, for better practice I, I i assume yes that's right chris we're, we're campaigning for better ocean stewardship um across a, a multiple range of, of uh of areas of ocean use um from wild catch fisheries to aquaculture but a, a key part of um on on the on the fisheries part is uh, along the lines of what we've discussed is in improving management of the stocks moving up from eliminating IUU into developing uh, more sustainable strategies for stock management and implementing that and and working uh, across um, nations as well so in, into the RFMOs working between coastal states to manage shared stocks of fish, uh, sustainably. I think the other area that we uh, that we're working on uh, across uh, multiple seafood buyers is is in the northeast Atlantic and, and sort of the area that that Erin's talked a little about with NIAF, uh, we're working with um, with an organisation called NAPA, North Atlantic Pelagic Advocacy Group, uh, which is an organisation of sixty seafood buyers buying fish from from NIAF uh, waters. So herring, blue mackerel, uh, sorry, blue mackerel, uh, blue whiting, and and, and and mackerel, and and they this was a coalition that that formed when the MSC certification was lost from those fisheries in response to that, to, to put pressure on the RFMOs and the coastal states to recognize the importance of coming back to the table. Yeah, okay. Um, and that's a very interesting body, 40, uh, it's for 60, 60 companies you say now involved in, in, in that. And uh, I'd be interested to know from Erin how much influence it's having, but glo take the global picture. Uh, CBOS represents, I think, the 10 largest buyers but it still only represents a small fraction of the total amount of fish that's that's caught caught globally it just seems to me that uh, you know from in terms of bringing about change for the better the fish producers who have a long-term interest in ensuring that stocks are are being fished sustainably 
should be doing more to put pressure to come to come together to agree common cause and putting pressure on policymakers to bring about the the changes which are which are required to to get rid to eliminate the fact that we are still according to the FAO fishing unsustainably in far too many seas. You're muted, Dave. Sorry, we discussed not to do that. Uh, I've managed to be the first to fall into the trap. Um, yes, I think the market has, a, has an absolutely key role in this uh, to, to ensure that we, we reward good actors and, and, and at least work with, with, uh, with the other actors to improve. And if they fail to improve, to exclude them from markets. But this is a, this is a challenge that, that we, we see globally in terms of price and, and availability of materials. I think we're in a position with with the sourcing that we take um, where we we have opportunities to source from different markets and we can step away when we feel there is a need to do that um, but that doesn't help to resolve the problem on the on the stocks that are then un, uh, unengaged with and i think one of the things that's that's critical for us is to have a, a mechanism to engage with the with the actors that need to pick up to eliminate the ieu and then move up to through the through the management approaches to, to develop more sustainable practices. Looking at some of the comments, if we were to just step away from areas uh, of, of fishery management, then then what? It, it could be a free for all, and that that's the worst status that that we want to end up with. We we need to continue engagement, but we also need to see progress. I think that's where the fishery improvement projects come in, where you've got time bound goals towards improvement, clear clear leads from markets on expectations on that, but then also teeth from the RFMOs and, and the coastal nations to bring up the, the legislation behind to exclude the, the poor performance after a certain point. If I may add something. Yes, please, Victor. I, before, I earlier, Chris, you said that maybe CBOS was, you know, it represented a very small fraction of the total global seafood catch. Uh, and that's right. So your question was, well, how can they still be effective in influencing RFMOs? And I would say that in recent years, there has been tremendous alignment in the majority of organizations that want to influence RFMOs to the extent that uh, sometimes at RFMO annual meetings, there are letters submitted with a specific ask very often around harvest strategies or things like this and those letters are signed by 25 ngos by a number of individual retailers by groups of retailers by processors by fisheries associations you know and they may end up with 150 signatories or so and they're really powerful letters because they tell the decision makers oh all these people are aligned behind this you know this must be really really important so that's a good practice in my view. That's only very recent, but there is a lot of alignment. And even though individually, these different signatories may not have a lot of influence, when they do something collectively like that, it can be quite powerful. Okay, thank you very much. As we come towards the end of our, our first hour, um, before we start looking at questions and, and uh, take a more uh, reflective view, um, I just want to put quest some questions to you about how we make further progress. I mean, this has been a very positive discussion, really, and it's much more positive than I would have expected because, you know, I mean, the figures, the, the, the FAO figures about unsustainable practices are, are something which I think concern most environmentalists. So if we're making good progress, well, excellent, let's continue, but how do we advance it? How do we ensure that best practice is followed and bad practice eliminated? Let's take one thing for granted. Uh, almost everyone has mentioned transparency is a good thing. Yes. Could argue why is transparency not being practiced then? I mean, even in the EU, EU at the uh, the annual uh, negotiation on on uh, on tax, uh, the, uh, the the setting of the annual quotas, um, that's still taking place behind closed doors because uh, um, ministers choose to keep it that way. Um, and although best better practices are being followed, there are still suspicions that they're not being followed properly. So, so transparency, a good thing. What else? What do we need to do? Um, Rowan. Yeah, thank you, Chris. I think one of the main things that I would like to see is, is greater transparency around compliance, as we've discussed, 
I think that is one of the simplest things is at the moment, it seems like RFMOs have some pretty key strengths, but some areas they need to work on. They have clear objectives, they have science advice and, and bodies providing that very well in, in most of their forums, and they have some proven management tools. So what I'm seeing are the gaps, and this relates to transparency, is they need the will to act and they need to follow through. And so compliance and the reason for transparency is the ability to evaluate what's actually being done. And I think that's part of why this is kind of emerging as a theme is I think that a lot of RFMOs, they're set up to, to achieve a certain objective. They have a lot of the, the right tools in place to, to go about achieving that objective, but we're not always seeing that outcome delivered. And so transparency equips us with a better understanding of where the gaps exist, which then enables civil society and other actors to keep highlighting and working to improve those things. Because I see this as... This is going to be a, a situation that continues to evolve, but more than that, for the reasons that Erin was outlining, it's only going to get more tricky to deliver sustainable outcomes in an increasingly polarised world where climate change is moving fish stocks around. It's, we've worked under the assumptions of a largely static world in which this would be an easier thing to manage up to date, but that's no longer going to be an assumption that will hold. So transparency is the way of working out where the next problem is going to arise and being able to respond to it. So that I think that's the reason why it keeps coming up as a theme. You're on mute, sir. Uh, now you're muted. Chris, it's you now. What do you, need to, what do you need to do to promote transparency? What do you need to do to, to persuade those people sitting around the table at these RFMO meetings to, to, to adopt a, a greater degree of openness? I would say one of the things is to ask for it and to highlight the benefits from it and to, to create rewards and recognition for those who are doing the right thing. So that's one of the reasons why certification exists to incentivize transparency. We all of the reports from fishery assessments against the MSC standard are public and people are rewarded with that. They, they gain market access and potentially premiums on occasion for doing that. So I think part of it is the incentive of their existing and recognition and reward. But I would also say that we need others who are doing the right thing to keep highlighting this, but we also need people to put their hand up and say, we're, we recognise we're not there yet, but we want to improve. So it's got to be a willingness to, to take that step and for that to be seen as constructive, right? This is not about blame, this is about improvement. And I think if it's owned as that, we can actually start to see some progress, mate. And Victor? What do we need to do to persuade policymakers? Who who has to do who has to do the job of persuading policymakers to adopt better practices? All of us collectively. Uh, I think we all need to push in the same direction, and we need to talk more about how to align uh, ourselves in making that push. And when I say we, I mean we, the whole world, the NGOs, the consumers associations, the retailers associations, everybody, everybody has very, very similar objectives. And it's, I think, quite easy to agree on on the big picture things, not on the details. When you start discussing the details, the devil is always there. Uh, but on, on big things like harvest control rules, modernizing fisheries management, having better and more transparent compliance mechanisms, and so on, I think everyone can agree on that. OK. And uh, and Dave, commercial interests, I mean, I, I mean, what you've been saying is that cargo has a good story to tell, that most of its fish is now coming from uh, either certified fisheries or, or uh, and almost all its products are coming from, from something which is either certified or in an improvement area or, 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 or like. So that's a, that's a good story. But the commercial interest, surely you'd, you'd, you'd think you, you buy the fish. You are in a tremendous position to influence influence policymaking because, you know, if, if, if you don't buy the fish, then... Then the then, then the interests of the of, of the fishing industry are, are are destroyed. Absolutely, Chris, and I, I think that that's part of, of what Victor was saying there uh, earlier as well about the power of the market to influence and, and send letters of support towards some of these directions, as well as make purchasing decisions. And, and we've we've done both over the years um, to to guide the, that that discussion with it with the industry sector. Um, starting from the discussions with the industry about whether to get certified or not to them it, it's a cost of course but it, it's part of the market pull and, and it demonstrates and provides verification of, of certain standards and, and including sustainability and that and that 
progression through that to, to show the need for this is really important. That's what that's exactly what we can provide. But I think what we've also seen in the last three or four years is that we can't just get up to a certain standard and expect to, to maintain that. We've seen what happened in, in the NEAFG area. Uh, we, we've talked a little bit about migration of stocks already on this uh, on this webinar just now, but, but in certain areas, stocks migrating from traditional fishing grounds into new fishing grounds, we, we really need to strengthen the discussions on beyond the, the, uh, the uh, individual nations that we were discussing with now into the neighboring nations and into the, into the RFMOs as, as the tools to be able to deal with that. So I think um, we, we have developed to a certain level so far. Uh, we have more to do, of course, but also we've got to be, make sure that we're resilient going forwards and, and make sure that in the, in the face of changing pressures, we're, we're able to survive on that as well. I think that that's a, a critical part that we're reviewing now is how to how to engage that that area there that that forward looking resilience. Erin, um, thank you very much, Dave. Erin, the Marine Stewardship Council's theory of change is uh, is, is is to is promote partnership, if you like, between the fishing industry and the retailers and the consumers to 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 recognise the, the the commercial interests that people, all these people should have in long-term sustainability of, of, of fish stocks. But I wonder also on the, you know, if you want to bring about positive change in governmental organizations, which our FMOs are, then there's a need to influence policymakers. There's a lot of good policymakers out there. And I'm speaking here as someone who was a 17 years as a parliamentarian. There's a lot of people out there who perhaps don't attach great importance to, to fish, but actually recognize that some of the statements that have been made during this discussion are things that they should be supporting and they should be pressing perhaps uh, their own governments for greater transparency and for, 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 for positive uh, proposals to be put forward in, in our FMOs. I just wondered, you know, is the MSC doing sufficient to engage with policymakers to push this agenda? I hope so. I mean, we have evolved quite a lot in the last couple of years um, to really engage with policymakers and see a strong role for us because at the end of the day, um, you know, we want to end overfishing as an organization. We want to work with other NGOs and with other stakeholders across the seafood supply chain to make that happen. Ultimately, we have the same goal. We want to see healthy, thriving uh, marine stocks and natural resources and healthy habitats. So I think to get there, our FROMOs have a huge role to play in this. Um, and when you talked earlier about what's missing, I would like to add that I think RFMOs can have a strength and mandate. I think the mandate of RFMOs, sometimes it's a sort of secretariat function of NIAF. How can we strengthen that to have even more accountability um, within those platforms to strengthen the, the sort of push-pull around sustainable fisheries management and what needs to happen within those management agreements? And also looking specifically at the tools, you know, whether there's strong enough arbitration or dispute resolution mechanisms within uh, these bodies to be able to cut through those national interests to get a deal. At the end of the day, um, the hardens tragedy of the commons, we're seeing this play out where national interests override uh, the prevailing objective of sustainability and the good of the commons. And in the case of the NEA Pelagics, um, we're failing on that account. But we do have an opportunity. I think we can look to other RFMOs that have pulled through the recent example of the WCPFC uh, to be able to move beyond these national interests um, in the face of changing climate, in the face of political change. There will always be an excuse to not get a deal. And I think now is the time to make uh, governments are meeting this week. Um, the coastal states are meeting this week as we talk, and I think there's a, a strong message that we collectively, um, as organizations interested in this, can put to them, which is it's their responsibility to, to use these discussions, to use international fisheries management to get a deal so stocks are managed in line with scientific advice, and that's good for consumers, good for the fish, and it's good for the supply chain as well who rely on these sustainable stocks for the future. You're on mute again. <laughs> Indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and thank you all. Uh, this is the end of our, our first 
this part of this this this, this webinar our roundtable discussion. So I'd like to thank Rowan Curry, the Chief Science and Standards Officer for the Marine Stewardship Council, and Erin Priddle, who you've just heard, the North Europe Regional Director. I'd like to thank uh, Victor Restrepo, Chair of the Scientific Advisory Committee of uh, the International Seafood Sustainability Foundation, and Dave Robb, Program Lead, Sea Further Sustainability from Cargill Aquit Nutrition. Now, we've not finished though. Uh, you, if you wish, you can go away and make yourself a cup of coffee or have some lunch or, or, or what have you, but please uh, sit around and, and uh, send in a question because we have a chance for a bit uh, of informal knock around some, about some of the, the questions that have been sent in and some other issues. So um, one issue being sent in by, by Doug Butterworth here, which is about sustainability and, and what it means in practice. And I recall when we were talking about the reform of the common fisheries policy in the EU, these same issues came up. I mean, what is sustainability? Are we, are we, are we, I always wanted, I have to admit, I, wa I want sustainability to mean that not only are we not producing fish stocks, but we are actually rebuilding fish stocks to try and recover their former abundance that we're told existed, certainly around the coast of Europe, um, to, to, to an extraordinary degree a century or, or more ago, but which have been sadly depleted. Do we need, are, are we in the business simply of preventing further decline, or are we in the business of trying to recover fish stocks to their former abundance? Who should we go with? Um, Victor, I suppose. Go for that. Yeah. Uh, Doug Butterworth always knows the answers to the questions that he asks. So so this is a, a tricky one for me to, to respond to. Uh, but I would say that his question is very good. What is sustainability in that before any discussion where an agreement needs to be made on some management aspect, whether it's to recover a stock or to maximize the catches over a long term or whatever, there is always a need to have very clear on the table what are we talking about? So for me, sustainability, one way to measure sustainability is through the 28 or 29 principal indicators of the Marine Stewardship Council. And if we go into a discussion and we say, this is the metric by which we measure sustainability, these MSC standards, for example, I'm not saying it's the only metric, but if we say that, then we have the rules clear for the debate and the necessary agreement on management. That's how I like to measure sustainability because I think it's a pretty comprehensive set of actions. Other people will not agree because they don't contain those 29 uh, principal indicators, don't contain much, uh, if anything, on social and labor issues. So, okay, you may want to have a different definition of sustainability that includes those. So my point is things need to be very clear on the table before you can progress uh, these difficult fish, fisheries management issues. Dave, can I just ask you, uh, what would be Cargill's definition? What would it be seeking to achieve? I would have thought, I would have thought from our discussions that uh, just, just it, it wants to be able to supply its customers in 100 years time and uh, the fish stocks are going to be there to do that. Very simple. That that's absolutely part of it, Chris, is is making sure that the resources that we use from are available, not just for us today, but into the into the future. And, and when I say us, I mean on a, a global perspective as well. We're not we're not depleting resources for other users as well. But I think the, the point that Victor just made about there's a progression in terms of the, of the goals that you can have from uh, partly answering Doug's question as well is, is saying, well, you can set goals for development. You don't have to as, go right to the end. And, and if you can't make the end the, the best part, you can't use the rest of the resources at the moment. We need to work up through the progression to become more sustainable uh, through depending on where we're starting from. And I think that's also the approach that we're taking is working with, uh, with fisheries where Lower, lower levels of interventions are required at the moment to, to step up to the beginning, as, as well as uh, seeking higher level certification for, for top level uh, sustainability uh, verifications. Uh, we, we need to be able to work across a broad range of raw material basket uh, in that sense. Um, but I think also we have a, a requirement to be able to work across a range of actors to keep engagement with them and, and show that market pull for more sustainable fishing as well. 
Okay. Um, Erin, and you're muted, by the way. Um, Erin, um, just to say, uh, in the Northeast Atlantic, your concern may be not be about the definition of sustainability, but of trying to ensure that unsustainable practices are not allowed to continue. Yeah, I would, I would agree there. Uh, I think um, in terms of the definition of sustainability, I mean, uh, I'll operate through the lens of MSC in terms of the standard, fishery standard and what that requires. I think the policy, public policy definition is is different than that because uh, politicians are taking on board the sort of social and economic considerations of fisheries as well. And so as the MSC, uh, we need to kind of op operate and work within that space and understand that there are sort of different lenses to view this. But ultimately, what we are seeing play out in the Northeast Atlantic is on sustainability um, of the largest kind, I think. This is one of Europe's largest biomass that is not managed uh, according to basic minimum sustainability standards. Um, so we have a gap in sustainability for sure in this region. Thank you. Uh, and turning to you, Rowan, you've just, uh, I mean, the, the whole Marine Stewardship Council certification arrangements have just been tightened up. You've set new standards, I think. Um, and of course, when you talk about sustainability, you introduce, as we've discussed before, you introduce elements like good governance as well as we're not talking simply about fish stocks and how much you catch. You also look at you know, the, the whole, whether, whether there's pr proper scientific assessments. And indeed, I think Erin uh, said to me that uh, um, the whitefish people in Scotland have got to fill in 500 pages of documentation or, 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 or something. So I just wondered, you know, how have you increased the standards to address these issues? And because there's a balance here, if you increase the standards too much, do you lose fishing companies? I mean, are, are fishermen simply not prepared to sign up to MSC certification if the standards are so tight that 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 uh, the bureaucracy overwhelms them? Yeah, thank you, Chris. It's it's a difficult balance, if I'm honest, and it's one of the reasons why our standard reviews are quite quite a challenging process because everyone has a a view what sustainability is or should be. Um, and so we and we want to be inclusive of that. We also need to recognise the way that the world itself changes over time and how fisheries management best practice evolves. Um, what we found through our, our last standard review was that there were parts of our standard where the world had moved on, where people had introduced new ways of measuring or managing things. Um, things like, for example, shark finning completely unacceptable. That needs to be dealt with in all fisheries management regimes. Um, ghost gear, we need to deal with abandoned, lost and discarded fishing gear. Um, those kind of areas were, were sort of areas where we knew that we had to, to raise the bar. But one of the areas re very related to what we're talking about now is we recognise that for harvest strategies, particularly on the high seas, it was actually getting increasingly difficult to address two, two different but related problems. One was that we were seeing a lot of fisheries weren't actually successfully adopting harvest strategies. We've had some success stories today, but we've also had an awful lot of years where we weren't seeing much success. Um, and in addition to that, even when they were adopted, we were still finding circumstances like the Northeast Atlantic, where there had been management arrangements in place or there'd been catch limits, but stocks were still declining. And in places where they'd gone all the way to put in place a harvest strategy, as, as had happened in the Indian Ocean, we we're still finding that stocks weren't being uh, managed consistent with scientific advice. So we actually took a step there to change our standard in a way that raised the bar and raised the performance expected of those fisheries to say that what we now require is a state of the art harvest strategy, which means that you must explicitly deal with catch or effort constraints. So that's the, the, the area of, of um, which is the most contentious, which is allocation. We're now saying on the high seas, you need to have resolved that in order to have a fishery that meets our standard. So, and fisheries that don't have that will either not meet the standard um, or they will attract a condition and they'll need to close that condition in order to remain certified. So this is partly MSC recognising one of the drivers for sustainable management is actually addressing that really critically important area of allocation. Um, and realising that that was quite fundamental to long-term long sustainable outcomes. And we made that call because when we set our standard, we do track what works and what doesn't. And we're informed by the fact we've now got 25 years of history of examining this. And we saw that the fisheries that had dealt with this, they were getting different outcomes to those that hadn't. Okay. Um, okay. Again, some good examples here of, of, of best practice and what needs to be done to, to, to improve. 
But just looking at some of the bad practices, Victor, um, the Indian Ocean and the Indian Ocean, the IOTC, the Indian Ocean uh, RFMO, um, from what we hear, the, the yellowfin tuna stocks there, however good tuna may be managed elsewhere in the world, the yellowfin tuna stocks in the, in the, uh, in the Indian Ocean are under threat, um, being fished grossly unsustainably. I mean, how do you, why, why is that happening? I mean, given what we've all been saying about how people are recognizing the importance of sustainability and, you know, commercial interests are buying into it and such like, why have they not addressed this problem? That is uh, an RFMO that is not performing very well, at least for, for that species. It's being overfished uh, severely. I, I wouldn't say that to the point of extinction or anything like that, but it's really not a sustainable fishery. And the reason for that is that they have failed to reach agreements on basic things like allocation. Uh, there are many countries that simply don't want to agree by what collectively is decided or they don't even want to uh, take part in a collective kind of decision so it's very difficult and it will take a lot of work to work with all of the members of the indian ocean tuna commission to to reach agreements of catch limits that are within sustainable levels uh, because right now you know some years that they have agreed to to management actions, those agreements have been on the unsustainable side. So those are how not... much Can I ask, how, how much does politics come into this? I mean, I think, for example, I mean, the, the European Union, I think, uh, especially Sp Spain, some French and but maybe a bit of Italian. Um, I mean, the, the European Union fishes for yellowfin tuna in the uh, Indian Ocean. I think it catches about 25%. But, you know, it can be argued, I suppose, by the nations around the Indian Ocean that Europe's some distance away and shouldn't be there at all. I just wondered, you know, to what extent do these sort of issues come up, the nationalistic if, issues, if you like? Oh, yes, the, they are different in all of the tuna RFMOs uh, to different degrees, uh, because some tuna RFMOs are open to membership by any member of the United Nations, for example, while other RFMOs allow membership majoritarily for the coastal states, but they all recognize uh, membership for those that were fishing there historically. And the EU is one of those in, in the Indian Ocean. Uh, also, I believe that there are some uh, territories uh, like French territories in the Indian Ocean. So it's not entirely uh, a non uh, a non coastal state. You know, it's maybe it's a small one, but to some degree it is. So in the different RFMOs, membership is, is very different. And the big battle in allocation in Tunas tends to be between those with historical fishing rights versus uh, the developing coastal states that want to develop their own fisheries. So they want to essentially replace the historical fishing capacity by a fishing capacity that is uh, transferred to them. And that's a very difficult issue, and it's a hundred percent political. And how uh, maybe Erin could come into this, or, or, or Rowan? How do you how do you determine? And there's a question here from Hazel Curtis. How do how does the means of how does the allocation of fishing rights get determined in in, in these instances? I mean, who has a right to fish more than someone else? Is it, is it you'd think it might be done on population size, for example, or the or uh, or is it done on grandfather rights because people have been fishing there for, for longer than other people? Uh, do, 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 does money count? You know, the, 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 more, the more money, I don't know. I mean, I just, these are, these are impossible negotiations. Erin, just come in first because presumably in the Northeast Atlantic, this is why the whole thing's fallen apart because there has been some sort of gentleman's agreement about how, 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 uh, how the rights will be shared out. But other, other for example, small nations like, Iceland, even smaller in terms of population size, Greenland might, might, might be saying, well, you know, why we're a huge size. We haven't got many people. We've got a huge size. Why shouldn't we be allowed to get a bigger quota than than the European Union, which may be enormous, but, you know, why, why should it dominate? Yeah, this is the, this is my, the sun has come out. I'm something to block me out. There we go. Um, this is the... The, the toxic element of the negotiations is the quota allocation. The MSC 
doesn't take a view on how they should share up that pie. That that's not that's not our our remit. It's it's for the coastal states to agree on that. But what I do know is that at least within the coastal states, uh, within NEAFC, they are looking at things like um, uh, zonal attachment, you know, where the fish are within the waters. They're looking at historical uh, allocation, hugely important for the EU, for dependency, Greenland, um, Iceland, who have high welfare states with 25% GDP around uh contribution of fishing, whereas, you know, the UK is, I, I think, 0.1%. I mean, big differences and, and, and how you weight those in a negotiation is really important in terms of that outcome. And so again, it's not for us to say what, what it should be. Um, I think the first quota allocation review um, platform within NEAF had something like 25 different criteria. I mean, how do you get a deal out of that? They've, they've now narrowed it down to four or five key criteria. So there's a process within that around how you select the criteria, how you're gonna weight it, and then ultimately what that outcome is gonna be. Um, so this is, this is the nub of it, Chris. This is what they have to try and cut through. And also you can review in some instances, uh, fisheries in, in other, I think in Canada and, and the US, do a kind of five or, or 10 year review period of, of what that quota allocation looks like, recognizing that stocks change. And they do have compensation mechanisms built in or baked into the framework. So to Hazel's question, of course, there are mechanisms to trade, uh, to compensate, et cetera. And whether those um, closed door negotiations are looking at those different criteria and different options uh, is, is a question I can't answer. But okay. I hope they are. <laughs> and Victor, Victor, you've, you're sitting on the ICAT Secretariat for many years. I mean, you must have seen all sorts of deals being done where, where um, you know, the, the deal was sealed, not because of looking at the figures, but because something was done behind the scenes to uh, ease the path, which had nothing to do with fishing, but maybe... You know, a car factory was promised for for, for for someone's home region or something. I don't, you know, nothing to do with fish. Is that the case? I, I'm sure that that happens. But, you know, even if I knew, I wouldn't tell you what I knew. No, no, no. You, you, you'd, be, you, you'd be nailed to the wall or something if you, if you were to reveal the truth. OK. But, Dave, but, I, but that's, I, I think that's part of, uh, I mean, sometimes uh, economists like to use the term over allocation. Because sometimes the initial agreement has to start with a quota that is higher than what the scientific advice is in order to put everyone under the allocation umbrella. And that's what happens sometimes. You know, so there are different things. There may be the car factory deal behind the scenes, but there is also things that are done transparently that are not right initially. I mean, it's not the greatest way to start, but it's something that eventually will lead into uh, a well-managed stock that is fully allocated. So there are many different uh, instances. And to add to what Erin said, uh, in the ICAT example in the Atlantic, they developed in the early 2000s a set of criteria for allocation. And I think it's close to 100. And there is a flavor uh, of ice cream for everybody in that list. So it's very, very difficult to, to use something like that for a negotiation without some kind of weighing criteria. Dave, let me come to you and I just want to ask a question or put a question to you that's come in about uh, about all those countries that are not following good practice. I mean, Cargill, you, you, you stressed, is, 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 is buying a lot of certified fish and emphasizing the need for sustainability and the like. But I mean, there are countries across the world that, I mean, how, how do you decide who not to trade with? I mean, we're thinking after all of, how do you even know? I mean, the, the, the amount of IUU, illegal uh, fishing taking place would not, would not be occurring if it weren't that they found a market for their products. And sometimes it's difficult to know where those products were originally fished. Yes, I think that, that's a, a fair point, Chris. And I think one of, the, one of the advantages that we have in our sourcing is that our, our supply chains are relatively short. Um, a lot of the material that we're sourcing from comes from within uh, the, the nation's EEZ uh, catch area. And so there are tools for us to be able to carry out risk assessments and due diligence uh, assessments on our supply chains. 
before we then move over to verification systems such as certification as well. So uh, where the certification isn't in place, we can also carry out risk assessments on, uh, on, on a particular country for risks on IUU and, and increasingly labour uh, rights as well. So I think that, that gives us an opportunity. Um, obviously, we have to take, take care of potential of, of mixing and fraud, um, but that, that goes into our uh, approach of trying to get our suppliers onto the certification scheme so that we have a level of, of scrutiny of, of their operations as well to give us that verification of good practice. Thank you. One one the, oh, sorry, Chris, there's one other point that was just in my head in where it becomes really difficult to differentiate between good actors and let's say less good actors um, is in, in shared stocks. And, and so uh, go, go to Northeast Atlantic again, I know we've talked a lot about it, but it's a case in point. If there's a good actor on blue whiting, uh, let's say, how do we reward them and, and put pressure on, on the others? That's very challenging because um, the, the, the fishery is a, is a shared stock and, and by one actor behaving well and the others not, the whole stock becomes under pressure. So it becomes very challenging with a shared stock to, to, to reward a good actor uh, on their own, I, 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 but as we see it at the moment. I'd love to hear from, from others as well around that in, in terms of how we could recognise a good actor and reward them there. Well, good actor. Okay, recognise a good actor. Can I ask a question about a suspect actor, which is China? Um, the biggest fishing fleet in, in, in on the world. Just just quick answers, please. I, I know nothing about the extent to which China is involved in in uh, in regional fishery management organisations trying to put in place good practice. Uh, Rowan, first of all, did, did you come across? I mean, where are we with China? Wow, what what a big question, Chris. Um, I would say that that. That China does participate in a number of individual RFMOs um, and China, like many of the other members, will have its own view as to what it believes good is. Um, in my experience in RFMOs, China has been increasing its presence and its, and its involvement in RFMOs over time. And I think this has happened quite a bit over the past decade or so. And a lot of that has come from sort of the, a, a traditional way of engagement that is common for China and other multilateral forums, which is it tends to, to get in the room and get comfortable and understand and engage with the, the process of what's being adopted before it starts to engage with advancing its own interests. But we've seen that pattern unfold in a few RFMOs and, and China increasingly engage on that. I would say there's there's not necessarily a reason to single China out as, as, as a good actor, for, for want of a better term, or a bad actor. I think a lot of the individual actors in RFMOs will have reasons why they engage on a particular issue in a particular way. And often that is to do with the interests that they're reflecting. So if they have a very strong commercial interest in a particular species, they might be very vocal on that topic, um, maybe less so on other issues. Um, so I think it probably varies quite widely. And you'd see that for a number of the other sort of larger powers too, is that there'll be certain issues they're very vocal on, certain issues that they're less vocal on. I will say that China was supportive of adopting the harvest strategy in the Western and Central Pacific Ocean, which I think was really encouraging to see. And I think that kind of, of recognition from different member governments, perhaps putting aside some differences here, is incredibly important. Um, and and it, otherwise, if we sort of fall back into the, the traditional view of, oh, I, I have a different political view to you, therefore I can't work yeah, with yeah. you, yeah. multilateral institutions, that can be corrosive for them. Okay. And um, so it's, yeah, it's really important that that, that spirit of cooperation continues. Thank you. Uh, Victor, quick comment in China? Come across them much? I couldn't agree more with uh, everything that Rohan said. And I would also add that sometimes there are criticisms that are voiced as, you know, if certain act is illegal. And not only China, but many other countries are increasing their fishing capacity, fishing for tunas or for other species. It's not only China. And usually they do so legally because there, there are very few capacity limits in any of the RFMOs. There are no capacity limitations and transfer of capacity from one RFMO to others is allowed in, in many cases. So that's not something illegal. Some people might not like it, but it's not illegal. Dave, uh, any engagement with China? Very quickly. 
Uh, relatively limited. We buy a bit of Chinese material for our operations in China, um, but uh, we we see them as players in in the in the fisheries that we do engage with globally, particularly in West Africa. Um, but uh, not more, more in the in the high seas there, where we're purchasing from EZ uh, waters. Okay. So limited exposure. And Erin, in the Northeast Atlantic, you haven't got China, but you have got Russia, which, to say the least, is problematic for other reasons. That must make things even more complicated. It certainly does. Yes, not least uh, because Russia are not able to be part of the IC's um, framework for inputting their scientific advice at the moment. So that that complicates things. Absolutely. OK, right. Very last question. And this has to be answered in sort of 10 seconds. No more um, from Matt Whit Watson, who's just saying or putting the putting the point that others have said uh, that maybe there should be a ban on fishing in the high seas altogether. Uh, would this increase the value of domestic? Well, basically, would it increase the value value of stocks? Um, Victor, I I don't think so. I I don't agree with that point, and all of the scientific papers that I have read about it are quite weak in their methodology. And what will likely happen is that a lot of fishing effort will be transferred from the high seas to coastal areas, and the impact will be the same as before. To the stocks okay. but, and final point rowan i'll just finish with you do you have a comment on that should we ban fishing in the high seas for a while i can understand why people raise it because they have concerns about the conduct of of some some fisheries in some areas i think it's using a sledgehammer to squash a fly i think it's an it's an overcorrection. and in fact if you're going to spatially manage areas using things like marine protected areas not unlike fisheries management in any other way, you need to define what your objectives are and actually measure that you're delivering those objectives. And I think it's, it's in my experience at least, and I've been involved with some work to adopt some very large MPAs in, in parts of the world. The MPAs that have been successful of those who have invested the time to work with all of those who are affected, including the fishing industry, to make sure that those MPAs will ultimately deliver the outcomes they set out to achieve. And I feel like this is a, a very simplistic answer to a much more complicated issue. OK, well, thank you all very much indeed for taking part. Uh, my guests today have been Rowan Curry. You've just been hearing now from the uh, Marine Stewardship Council. He's the Chief Science and Standards Officer. You've heard, heard also from the MSC's Erin Priddle, the North Europe Regional Director. You've heard Dave Robb from Cargill, Cargill Aqua Nutrition, and you've heard Victor Restrepo, the chair of the Scientific Advisory Committee for the International Seafood Sustainability Foundation. And I think it's been a really interesting talk. Thank you very much all. And thank I hope uh, those of you listening have enjoyed it too. So thank you for taking part in this Blue Deal debate number 14. All thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Bye.